This morning, we're going to be in, in, in a few different passages. I believe you have the outline in your bulletin. And we're going to, the subject, the title, I should say, today of the message is Thank God for Godly Mothers. What we'll do is take a look at some of three examples of godly mothers that we have recorded for us in the biblical passages, the scripture of which is made already readily available to us, the divine word of God preserved over all these centuries, the eternal word of God, that which will never be void, the eternal, uh, dependable word of God. It's straight from the word of his mouth, and therefore it is divine, and we're going to treat it as such. And we'll look at some of the examples in there of, of motherhood contained within the Old Testament and the New. Before we get to that, I'm going to share with you all something. This is in my files. I do not remember where I found it, but some years back I found this. The, the source is somebody by the name of Frederick Cruz. I don't remember if this is a book, a magazine article, what it was, but I typed this out several years ago. And listen to this. Perhaps you've heard this, talking about mothers. And perhaps mothers you can identify with some of the traits that Brother Cruz shares in this short uh, narrative, if you would. Uh, all of us will be able to some way pick out and say, yep, that's mom. That was my mom or that is my mom. Well, listen to what he writes. He says, somewhere between the youthful energy of a teenager and the golden years of a woman's life, there lives a marvelous and loving person known as mother. You may have known her as mommy or mom or some other title. He goes on to write, A mother is a curious mixture of patience, kindness, understanding, discipline, industriousness, purity, and love. Can you get an amen to that? Okay. A mother can be at one and the same time both lovelorn counselor to a heartsick daughter and head soccer coach, an athletic son. A mother can sew the tiniest stitch in the material for that dainty prom dress. And she's equally experienced in threading through the heaviest traffic with an SUV. Amen? A mother is the only creature on earth that can cry when she's happy, laugh when she's heartbroken, and work when she's feeling ill. I thought I'd hear the mothers want to say amen to that. A mother is as gentle as a lamb and as strong as a giant. Only a mother can appear so weak and helpless and yet be the same one who puts the fruit jar cover on so tightly that even dad can't get it off. A mother is a picture of helplessness when dad is near and a marvel of resourcefulness when she's all alone. A mother has the angelic voice of a member in the celestial choir as she sings Brahms' lullaby to a babe held tight in her arms. Yet this same voice can dwarf the sound of an amplifier when she calls her boys in for supper or cheers them on at a game. A mother has the fascinating ability to be almost everywhere at once, and she alone can somehow squeeze an enormous amount of living into an average day. Y'all can identify this. A mother is old-fashioned to her teenager. Can you get an amen up here? Just mom to her third grader and simply mama to the little two-year-old sister. And he concludes with this, but there is no greater thrill in life that can compete to pointing to that wonderful woman and be able to say to all the world, that's my mother. Amen? This morning as we look at examples of motherhood, godly examples of motherhood in Scripture, we'll turn first Back to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 2 in the Old Testament. As we look at Jochebed, the mother of Moses. Exodus chapter 2. I'm not going to ask you to stand this morning. But I will ask you to, to turn to the passages, find those, and to pay honor and tribute to God's Word. Give it the, the, uh, the, the honor that it deserves. In Exodus chapter 2, the first three verses... We, we read this about Jochebed. There's an illustration of her, an artist's depiction of her on the screen. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. 
Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And of course, we're talking about here, as we conclude reading that passage there, this is the story of the birth of Moses, as he recorded for us in this book that, that he penned through human hands. And you know the story here of Moses. He, he, he was born at a time right after the Pharaoh had given order to the midwives who were delivering the babies for the, for the Israeli children, who were at that time in bondage and slavery, if you would, in Egypt. They were uh, uh, forced into to hard labor to build for the Pharaoh all these building projects and other forms of labor. But the children of Israel were beginning to grow in number. They started off 400 years prior to this as just the, the twelve sons of Jacob and their immediate families. They came down because of the, the uh, famine in the land. Joseph, one of the twelve sons who had been sold into captivity by his older brothers, ended up in Egypt, ended up ascending through the ranks because of God's hand in his life, became the second in command in Egypt. Because of his wisdom and God's leading, he stored up in Egypt seven years worth of grain because God told him the famine was coming. So Egypt was one of the few places in that region of the world where you could provide for your family and get food for them during the, the hard, difficult times of the famine. So Jacob brought his family down. They got the grain. They ended up settling there. They got some, pride, some uh, wonderful land given to them by the Pharaoh. But now, 400 years later, they've become so large... They've become a threat to, to the people of Egypt, the threat to the, the Pharaoh, the leadership of Egypt. And he tells the midwives, gives them the order that if, he, if an Israeli woman, a Hebrew lady, was to bear a child, they could keep the daughters, but any of the sons that were born were to be thrown into the Nile. Infanticide. Casting aside these healthy young boys just because they were boys throwing them into the Nile. Jochebed, one of the Hebrew ladies, gave birth to a son. She says, I can't let that happen to my boy. I can't let that happen to my boy. And she began to, to seek after the Lord. And in these verses, we see what she did under God's leading. She, she put him into a, a little basket. Literally, it's called an ark in Scripture. A little wicker basket covered it with tar and pitch so it would be waterproof and set it among the reeds on the banks of the Nile. And you know the story. The daughter of the Pharaoh came down. She saw the child. She sent one of her, her maidservants to get the child. And, and uh, through God's leadership and, and whatnot, uh, the, the, the sister, the older sister of Moses was able to go to the Pharaoh's daughter and say, I can get for you a Hebrew nurse to nurse this child for you, and end up being the mother of Moses himself, was able to nurse her child so he could grow. He grew up in the house of Pharaoh. But the point is, Jochebed, the mother of Moses, didn't just believe that just because the government, the Pharaoh, the leadership is ordering me to cast aside my son, I will not do that. She trusted God. Point number one is thank God for mothers who trust in God to provide for their children. The question is, as we think of that, thanking God for mothers who trust in God to provide for their children. Let me ask you this question, moms. Is there anything that you would not do for your child? Is there anything you would not do for your child? Jochebed was a mother that would do anything for her children. Jochebed, the, the, we actually learn of her name, by the way. It's not listed in this passage we just read, but later on in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, we learn her name. But there, it's, a, it's a name that means something. All, all of the biblical names mean something. Uh, to, to, today, if you, most of us, if we have a, what I call a traditional name or a common name, you can trace that back to either a Hebrew origin or a Greek origin or a, a, a Latin origin it has, a, it has a meaning associated with it. Well, her case, is Jochebed was a Hebrew name which, which really means Yahweh's glory or God's glory. And she wanted to, to live by that. In, 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 in Hebrews chapter 11, the great, what I refer to as the Hall of Fame of Faith or the Faith Hall of Fame where 
where the author of the, the book of Hebrews records out historically all these men and women and, and how they lived such great lives of faith. This is what he says in Hebrews 11, verse 23. He says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Amen? They were not afraid of the king's edict. The, the statement of that, of that author, we don't know who it is, or speculation, some think it's Paul, the book of Hebrews, others think it's somebody else. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit who's the author of Scripture. But, but the, the, the statement here is that the parents were led to preserve Moses' life because they had confidence in God. They had confidence in God. They believed that this child, a child who would be named Moses, was destined to some great purpose. They believed that, that, that God Himself would spare this child because God had a purpose for him. Even though the, the chances of him surviving in that political climate, the chances of him surviving in that culture, the chances of him rising to be able to do anything great for God were the, 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 the odds were just so heavily weighted against him. But they trusted God. They trusted God. Amen? Here's an example, a true example. I, I tried to find exactly when this happened. I couldn't find it. This is another illustration I, that I, I found some years back. But it talks about a mother and her child. True story. True story. When an L-1011, that's a, a passenger jet aircraft, when it left Orlando for its early flight to Atlanta this particular day, everything seemed normal. Everything seemed normal. The flight that day was carrying primarily professionals, businessmen and women who were traveling, as they often do during the week. And these seasoned travelers were well accustomed to occasional tense moments when some malfunctions would occur or when turbulence would happen. How many of y'all flown on airplanes and you, you, you've been there, you've, you've seen things such as that? But none of them, even though they, they fly all the time, none of those passengers that day were ready for what was about to happen. Just minutes after takeoff, the jet began to dip wildly. Began to lose altitude and just dip and fall. And the pilot climbed higher Struggled to lift the aircraft, but it didn't help. And he soon made an announcement to the, to the uh, pastor compartment that sent the entire load of people there into hysteria. Their hydraulic system had failed. They were turning to or, returning to Orlando, and they're making preparations to make a crash landing. Fuel began rushing by the windows. As the flight crew began to discharge any unnecessary fuel, trying to prepare for a crash landing, you don't want much fuel on board because then the plane will likely erupt into flames. The captain had the cabin ready for a crash landing. The, the flight attendants were preparing the passengers, telling them how, what to do, how to brace, how to prepare for impact. Fear gripped even the most stoic of travelers. Some were hysterical. Some were screaming. Even those that were quiet and apparently calm were scared. Scared! As you and I would be if we knew our plane was getting ready to have a crash landing. Chaos. Fear. Confusion reigned. But there was a lone calm voice that stood out like a marker of hope. A mother was looking to the eyes for a four-year-old daughter and speaking words of assurance in a normal, conversational tone. With her daughter's ramped attention, she continually said, I love you so much. I love you so much. Do you know for sure that I love you more than anything? The little girl said, yes, Mommy. Yes, Mommy. It was a sobering picture as those travelers knew of a similar and recent situation in which another young girl had survived a terrible plane crash. 
Experts speculated that in that particular crash, the girl was alive because her mother had strapped her own body over her daughter to shield the impact. That mother did not survive the crash. And now, these passengers on this jet, on this day, preparing for a crash landing, wondered if that would happen again. Before strapping her body over her daughter, the lady, the mother on this day, told the little girl, remember, remember, no matter what happens, I love you and I will always love you. You are a good girl. Sometimes things happen that are not your fault. You're still a good girl. And my love will always be with you. Then she readied herself for the crash landing. Words of peace and assurance in a hectic, chaotic, fear-gripped cabin. Words of peace from a mother to a child. Fortunately, her body was not needed as a shield for her child that day. For unknown reasons, the landing gear locked into place. For unknown reasons, the jet was able to land safely. A plane load of thankful travelers walked away from the jetway that day knowing that they had gazed into the very face of death itself. And one little girl, a four-year-old little girl, was carried off in the arms of a woman who had demonstrated the incomparable love of a mother for her child. Amen? I do see where that came from. That's, uh, uh, how many of you have seen the uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul books? That's where that came from. Let's transition to the next point. Chuck Swindoll, you know Chuck Swindoll? Most of you do. You know that name? Longtime pastor. He, he, he says these words. He tells the following story. He says, this is Chuck's words. He says, I smile as I remember the Mother's Day card I saw that was really cute. It was a great big card written in little child's printing. Little first grade printing. On the front was a little boy with untied sneakers. He had a wagon and toys were everywhere. He had a little cut on his face and there were smudges all over the card. The front of the card read, Mom, I remember that little prayer you used to say for me every day. And on the inside of the card were these words, God help you if you ever do that again. <laughs> Too much laughter on this side of the room over here. I don't want to know what the cause of that laughter is. Let's look at someone who did pray for the child every day. The, the Syrophoenician mother that we read about in Mark. Turn to Mark, if you would, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, second book in the New Testament. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. This is a story that is familiar to those of us who love the Gospels. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. Mark writes, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it. Yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. And she kept, she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, this is the words of Christ, let the children be satisfied first. For it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the, the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he, that's Jesus, said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. We'll stop right there. Go back if you would, look again at verse 26. The lady is described, she was a Gentile. 
meaning she was not of the Hebrew race. She was not an Israeli. She was described as a Syrophoenician race, one of those that were, were looked down upon, if you would, by the, the Hebrew children. And it says there, the last part of that verse, she kept asking him. She kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. She kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of the daughter. I think there's something we can learn from this. Point number two is this. Thank God for mothers who persistently seek after Him, who persistently seek after Jesus for their children. In other words, thank God for mothers who persistently pray for their children. Amen? Amen? Charles Spurgeon, my favorite pastor of all time, pastor of the mid to late 1800s over in London, England, he wrote these, he, these words. He says, I cannot tell how much I owe to the prayers of my good mother. I remember her once praying, Now, Lord, if my children go on in sin, it will not be from ignorance that they perish. And my soul must bear swift witness against them at the day of judgment if they lay not hold on Christ and claim Him as a personal Savior. Amen? She prayed, saying, God, and she confessed, saying they may wander astray, but it's not because they don't know any better. And it's not because I've sought to provide for them or to protect them. And God, it's not because I have not prayed for them. She knew that she had. And Charles Spurgeon was so grateful of that. Amen. How many of y'all are glad your mother's prayed for you? Amen. Amen. How many of y'all are hard today because your mother's prayed for you? I believe it. I believe that. I'm one of those. Another man is this. Lauren Sani of the Navigators. He once wrote these words of his mother. And I quote, My mother gave birth to me in a frontier house on a Midwestern prairie. On the kitchen counter, she placed a list of the ingredients necessary for my formula. How many of y'all make a formula today? Don't you just buy it in a store? I, I, I ain't been a parent in a long time. I, I seem to remember, I am a parent. <laughs> I've not been the parent of a little baby for a long time. Lord, protect me from myself. <laughs> but, but the times we for me, we just went and bought the stuff, didn't we, Robin? Poured in a bottle and gave it to him. So here you go, kid, something like that. But apparently back when this man was born, he had to mix up the form. He had to get the ingredients together. Y any of y'all do that? Any of y'all? Somebody did. Thank you. Thank you. So you can identify with this. But on the kitchen counter, his mother placed a list of the ingredients necessary for his formula. And listen to this. On the top of that list was prayer. On the top of the list was prayer. And he says, and that remained at the top of her list for me throughout her life. I have her to thank for firmly, firmly establishing my spiritual roots. Amen? Thank God for mothers who persistently pray for their children. Amen? Amen? If your mama's here right now, thank her for that. Thank her for that right now. Amen? Number three, we're going to look at Eunice and Lois. The final um, people we'll look at in Scripture today. 2 Timothy chapter 1, one single verse, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. This is the opening words of Paul in the second letter that he wrote to his young protege named Timothy, a man that he was grooming for leadership in the church, a man that was kind of coming under his tutelage, if you would, a mentor, uh, relation, mentor, mentor, re relationship he had. Paul was bringing him up, entrusting Timothy to lead some of the churches that he had planted. And here in this second letter to Timothy that he penned, in the very opening verses, in verse 5 of chapter 1, Paul writes concerning Timothy, he says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm sure that's in you as well. Paul's saying, he said, I know you're a man of faith, but brother, that came down the family line. You were trained well. You were trained in the things of God by your mother and your grandmother. How many of y'all are so thankful for a Christian heritage? Amen? Amen. But let me caution you on this. Just because your mother and your grandmother 
Your father and your grandfather, your brothers and sisters are Christians does not mean you are until you personally accept faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? It is a personal decision. It does not come through family line or heritage. It does not come through DNA. It only comes by abiding faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in Him to save you from your sins, turning to Him, devoting your life to Him. That's the only thing that will save you. Timothy was not saved because his mother was a Christian. He was not saved because his grandmother was a Christian. He was saved because he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Amen? So don't you think that God's going to look at you and say, Oh, you're from that family? That's a good family. Yeah, come on in. I'm going to let you into heaven. It don't work that way. It's never worked that way. It never will work that way. If your name's not in the Lamb's book of life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Enough of the side sermon. Thank God for mothers whose sincere faith has a godly impact on their children. Amen? Thank God for mothers whose sincere faith has a godly impact on their children. This illustration here shows the mother and the grandmother, Eunice and Lois, with little young Timothy listening to them as they taught him the things of God. Abraham Lincoln, the great president, quote is saying, and I quote here, No one is poor, who had a godly mother. Isn't that a wonderful quote? No one is poor who had a godly mother. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan had four sons. All four sons were preachers. Okay, picture that. All four sons. He had four sons and each of them became a preacher. Someone once came into the drawing room when all the family was there. The father, the four preacher sons, the mother, and other family members. They thought they would see what Howard, who was one of the sons, was made of. So they asked him this question. They put him on the spot. And he's one of the preacher sons. They said, Howard, who's the greatest preacher in your family? Well, Howard had a great admiration for his father. And he looked straight across at him. And then without a moment's hesitation, he said, the greatest preacher in my family is mother. It's mother. Got this off Christianity Today. A few years back, ChristianityToday.com asked readers to share how much their mothers and grandmothers meant to them. In response, one man by the name of Bill Fix of Taylor, Michigan, shared a moving testimony about his mother's faithful witness. I'm going to read you what he wrote to Christianity Today. He wrote these words. He said, Mom grew up around the coal mines where her daddy worked, deep in the mountainous regions of Virginia. She came from a large, poverty-stricken family. She learned how to be content with little. Dad and mom were poor by the world standards. But as a kid growing up, I didn't know that, he says. We were rich in so many other ways. Dad had two, sometimes three jobs. So mom could stay home and be a full-time mommy to her five children. She hummed softly as she went about her work. It was as if she'd blocked all the bad news out and was contemplating what was good and right and lovely. She was always living in the present, fondly reflecting on the past and looking forward to the future. She found that in the present there was love. In the past there was joy. And in the future there was hope. I will not forget the day the doctors told us that mom had terminal cancer. I was devastated by the news, he writes. Things did not seem to change for mom, though. Whenever I visited her, she was busy cooking or baking, maybe doing a load of clothes or sewing or working on something else. As she worked, she hummed a tune that seemed so beautiful to me. When I spoke with her about the cancer, she was calm. 
She told me that this is not really her home. She said she had a home in heaven and that she would be going there soon. She told me not to worry. that She'd be all right. Although that brought tears to my eyes, she continued to hum. I saw a beauty in my mother I'd never seen before. In her affliction, she had become radiant. When she died, she was only 59 years old. I have replayed her words many times. This is not my home. I have a home in heaven. Don't worry. I'll be all right. He goes on to say she is at her eternal home today. Since that time, he wrote, he says, I've become a pastor of a church where I've had an opportunity to see many people, like mom, go to another home. As I minister to many of them, I'm reminded of her, someone who is afflicted, yet radiant because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. This past week, I encourage everybody to do something this week to love on, to honor their mother, if their mother's still here, to do something in her memory, if she's not. This morning I said basically the same thing towards the beginning of the service. This is the day we are to honor our mothers. And now I want to ask you one final time to honor your mother. Some of your mothers are still living. Others have gone on to their eternal home. If you want to honor your mother, I suggest the best way to honor her is this morning to express your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you've never publicly proclaimed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that would be the best gift you can give your mother on Mother's Day. It's a turn to faith in Jesus today. Join me in prayer. Father God, this day... This is a day set aside to honor our mothers. It's a day, Father, where we are reminded to love them, to cherish them, to remember the lessons we've learned from them. Many in this room's mothers were Christian. Not all are or were. But Father... I know deeply inside that all of our mothers want what is best for us. They look for us to have a better life than they did. They look for us to make a difference in this world. They look for us, O Lord, to have a future that is so bright and full of hope. Father, the best way for all that to happen is for us as individuals to proclaim faith in Jesus Christ. To accept Him as our Lord and Savior. To turn away from our evil evil ways. To repent of our sins. To commit our lives to our Lord. So Father, today, help us to honor Mother on this day. To honor Mom. To honor Mommy. To honor our mothers, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers. All those who invested so much in our lives. Who prayed for us because they trusted in God those who lived a godly example, even those who did not, Father. We know they they wanted what's best for us. So help us to honor our mother today by honoring Christ. 
But Father, this is a day like all days where we're to bring the glory and the honor and the praise to You. Yes, this is Mother's Day, but it's also the Lord's Day. And this is a day that we've felt led through Scripture to gather together in a, as a corporate body known in this local church as Buffalo Baptist Church. This is the day and the time we've set aside to come and collectively bring you glory and honor and praise. And just like it was with our mothers, the best way, O oh Lord, that we have to glorify, to honor, to worship you is by doing that to your Son. To glorify, honor, and worship Him. So again, Father, Help us to be bold enough for the decisions that we know You're calling us to make. The changes we know we need to make in our lives. The rededication we need to walk in closer to our Savior. Maybe it's spending more time in the Word. Maybe it's spending more time in prayer. Maybe it's serving someone in need. Maybe it's recommitting to, to gathering with Your people on a regular basis. Maybe it's to join this local body of believers that we call the church. Whatever it is, O oh Lord, that You're putting on our hearts, help us to be bold enough and trusting enough and faithful enough to follow through with those decisions. Let us have enough courage to make it public today. We we'll praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.